Hello, friends. This is your friend, Kent C. Dodds. I'm so excited to be here with my friend, Saran Yitbarik. Say hi, Saran. Hi. Nice to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to have you here. You're an old hat at this whole podcasting thing. You've been doing <laughs> podcasting for longer than me, but um, I'm so excited to have you here on my podcast to chat with you about your life experience and share you with my friends, uh, my audience here. And so, yeah, what, as we get started, I, I do want my friends to get to know you. So if you could introduce yourself a little bit, tell us who you are and what, what you care about, and then we can chat about other things. Sure. That sounds great. So I'm Saran. I am a developer, podcaster, and entrepreneur. Um, I've been a developer for a couple of years, for a number of years now, six years now. A uh, podcaster also for six years now, um, and also started my business six years ago. So pretty even wow. in all those three categories. Um, I started a company called Code Newbie, which started as a Twitter chat, a community, and then grew into a couple podcasts and a conference. And it was recently sold to Dev, which is, I think, one of the largest communities of developers. They're an amazing, amazing company doing great work. And um, yeah, so now I am figuring out what my next move is, still podcasting, still coding. um, And now I'm actually in business school. So getting my MBA, uh, which is very different from learning to code and very difficult, but that's okay. (laughs) Um, And yeah, and I'm really into, you know, startups. I'm really into tech and really into community building. Oh, that's that's amazing. Like, how does it feel to be acquired? <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. It's so great. Um, and I feel like the timing of it worked out really well for us um, where I get to do. So I still work with the company. I still podcast um, and host the shows and I have editorial input and some of the new stuff they're working on. Uh, but it's just nice to not have to worry about anything, you know, and just to focus on the fun parts that I used to do and to kind of let go of sponsorships and producing a conference and the the other things that are just hard, you know? Um, so I feel really lucky in, in being in that position. Yeah, that's that's incredible. So uh, I can imagine the the relief that it would be. Um, but I'm guessing like those things are all still happening. You're just yes. not as involved or not at all involved anymore. Yep, exactly. Yeah. I get like, in, I get to provide my insight once in a while and that's pretty much it. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. I So I've definitely like handed off projects before maybe not something quite as big as a conference or anything and and i can relate to the relief that you feel that like you don't want the thing to die like you're glad you want it to exist you just don't want to be the one to do it anymore because you're ready to move on so that's wonderful i'm i'm glad to um glad that happened for you and and looking forward to whatever it is that you do next um and for anybody who's listening who wants to learn more about this um experience in particular um, I was just listening to the Women in Tech podcast hosted by Esprit Devora, um, and Sharon, Sharon was on the on that podcast pretty recently, and it's a great episode. I'll link to it in the show notes. Definitely give that a listen for sure. Cool. So great. Um, I'm really interested to find out more of your story on how you got into tech because it is pretty interesting, and and you do talk about it in that other podcast. But um, I want to dig into a couple parts of that with you. So can you give us a little bit of your backstory of how you got into this? Yeah, sure. Uh, So I guess a good place to start is undergrad, where I was pre-med for three out of the four years of undergrad. I was really into the hard sciences. I taught organic chemistry. I was a research fellow. I was published in a biochemistry journal. Um, I had my research published. Yeah, I was like really into it. Um, (laughs) And then uh, I think it was either end of junior year, beginning of senior year, I shadowed a cardiologist which is something I really should have done much, much uh, earlier. And Mm. when I shadow that cardiologist, I got to like scrub into a surgery and, you know, walk with him and visit patients. And it was was a really interesting, really eye-opening experience. And what I learned was that what I loved about the sciences was the storytelling. It was what happens to this chemical when it reacts to this other chemical and how does the, the, you know, kidney process different liquids and like how, you know, it was kind of like the journey of the body that I I was interested in, not Hmm. so much the like saving people's lives. And I feel like Hmm. if you're a doctor, you should be really motivated by saving people's lives. That feels like, you know, an important part of that job. (laughs) Um, And so I said to myself, man, I don't think this whole being a doctor thing is for me, especially when you think about the fact that it's like an additional, you know, four, eight years of school. I was like, I don't think this is the right move. And so I was trying to figure out what I should do with my life. And I had always done journalism. 
So I had written for the school paper, um, interned at um, our local NPR member station. I'd written for a magazine. And so I said, well, maybe journalism is a good, you know, good place to go since I've clearly shown an interest in it. Mm. And so my first job out of college was actually working at NPR. And it was one of the best jobs I ever had. I got to bring in Boys to Men for an interview and they did a private concert for us, which was so Ooh, exciting it was, cool. it was amazing oh their voices are so beautiful um and, they show, <laughs> and i have like the photos to prove it it was great um and so that was one of the best jobs i ever had um and then i became a fact checker at discover magazine where i worked for a monthly publication and so the way that that works is every month they publish you know a bunch of articles so as a fact checker you only have work to do like one week out of the month because the articles aren't ready yet for to be packed to mm. be fact checked. And so most of the time I just spent just reading books and, you know, going like le- reading magazines and blogs and that sort of thing. And during that time, I read the Steve Jobs book. And that was the first time I was introduced to technology in a way that I could relate to where tech was talked about through the eyes of design and art and storytelling. And when I thought of tech, I thought of like, video games and I'm not into video games Mm. at all and so (laughs) you know and so I said huh maybe there's like space for me in this tech world maybe there's a place for uh for someone like me who doesn't think about you know like engineering and video games that thinks about like art and design and so I um, Googled and started reading all about the startup community, the startup world. I uh, cold emailed a bunch of startup CEOs, and one of those emails turned into a coffee, which turned into an internship, which turned into a job. And so that was my first kind of foray into tech. Uh, But I was always on the non-technical side of things. So I'd always done, you know, marketing, some sales and business development, um, never really product. And I worked in the startup community for a couple of years, and I felt like if I didn't get technically trained, I was never going to have the impact that I wanted to have on an organization. And I felt like I was always going to be limited in my career. And so after Mm. kind of bumping up against that wall a couple of times, I said to myself, you know what, I think it's time for me to just pause, invest in myself, take some time off. Um, I learned how to, I quit my job, learned how to code for a couple of months, did a boot camp for a couple of months, and then became a developer. Wow, that is an amazing story. You, there's so much legwork in, involved in <laughs> your story, and and you know it's interesting that um, you you went from doctor to journalist to software developer, and I feel like maybe there's some crossover in some of those areas, but that's a that's a lot of like that's a very broad yeah uh, set it's of, a lot of skills lot of leaps. and interests. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it's very interesting. So. Um, in in the process of doing this, uh, making these changes, were you ever like worried that you were um, maybe coming into it too late, or um, I, I don't know? Like I feel like par- lo- lots of this was risk, and you know, accepting the fact that you've got sunk costs <laughs> into the different things that you're doing. Like, what was the emotional um, roller coaster that you went through in this whole process? Yeah, I'm I'm really motivated by uh, frustration and kind of like reacting to frustration. So when I was working at the startups and I felt like I couldn't contribute to the product, I was frustrated. You know, when I felt like like I remember this one um, time I was overseeing a dev shop who was building a, a tool for us, and I just had a hard time communicating with them because I didn't know what they were talking about. You know, like I couldn't I don't know what a feature was or what a bug was, just simple things like that. I just had no idea. So it was really hard for me to shape the product and really have input. And that was like my job. Like my job was to oversee the product. And so that was really frustrating. And so I felt like when I bump up against frustration, I'm highly motivated to change kind of at all costs. And so um, that was a lot of the journey. A lot of the journey was kind of facing this frustration going, okay, I need to get rid of this and I need to kind of bring it back to to some type of, you know, normal. Um, and so that was the emotional journey was being frustrated. But I think that learning to code specifically was terrifying. It was really, really hard. Like I, and it was surprising for me how hard it was because a lot of my school was doing hard things. Like organic chemistry is notoriously one of the most difficult pre-med classes you can take. Like no one likes organic chemistry, let alone teaches organic (laughs) chemistry. You know what I mean? And so like to me, I was thinking like if I can conquer organic chemistry, why can't I figure out what a while loop is doing? You know what I mean? Like it was Mm. just, it was such a different way of thinking for me. And it, it took me a long time to just wrap my mind around just very basic concepts. And it made me feel like an idiot most of the time. Mm. And I think it was 
kind of remembering that frustration, remembering and just thinking like, okay, well, you can't go back to that place where you weren't contributing. So the only path forward is really learning how to code and just figuring it out and trusting that if you, you know, hit this wall and hit the ceiling and enough times, you'll eventually break through. And so for me, um, yeah, it's a story of fear and frustration. Yeah, well, <laughs> and, and how do you feel about things now? Feel, feeling pretty good now? <laughs> I feel like you made it through that. <laughs> yeah, I feel a lot better. I think the one thing I regret is that I wasn't a I wasn't working as a developer for that long. I went into doing uh, management for a technical training program at Microsoft, and then with my business with Code Newbie, it's a company for developers, but the company itself is content, right? It's kind of similar to what you're doing is you're like doing teaching. I was doing like content mm. production, so. Um, I don't really get to code that much anymore, which is kind of unfortunate, you know. And so one of the things now that I have more time that I want to get into is like really focusing on my technical skills and trying to kind of level up in that regard, because that, um, you know, it's, it's funny, I feel like I worked so hard to become technical. And then after a couple of years, I kind of realized that maybe I could do things without needing to code all the time. And so it kind of like took my career in a slightly different direction, which is unexpected. Uh, But now I really want to like get back into the middle of things. Hmm. So do you think that there's like, like in that process, did you ever feel like, you know what, maybe coding isn't for me and and I should go do something else? Or like, what was your thought process around um, switching to uh, making these career, like really impactful career switches? Um, why didn't you end up saying, you know what, like coding is really hard or maybe it's not for me. Let me go try something else. What was it about each one of these stepping stones that made you stick with it for the, the time that you did? Yeah, that's a great question. So I really enjoyed coding. Like I finally got to a place where I overcame not all of my fears, but a lot of them, um, enough of them to really enjoy the moments when I didn't know what I was doing and things were coming together and I had things I could show off and, you know, things I could show my mom. Like, you know, those moments are always a lot of fun. Those are great moments. It's a great moment, uh, but she didn't, you know, really get it, but that's okay. Um, (laughs) (laughs) And so um, I really enjoyed it. And so that's what made me kind of stick with it. And even when I was doing my own business where I wasn't, you know, I was a a CEO, like I wasn't, you know, um, like a a software engineer, I still like found any opportunity I could to build like my own features. And I built a bunch of like, you know, admin tools and a bunch of things to support the podcast and like publishing the podcast and um, things that were just a lot of fun. So for me, I never fully like got away from it because I really enjoyed it. Like I thought it was a lot of fun. I always I think I always knew, though, that to some degree, I didn't necessarily want to be like a CTO or like an architect. Like, I don't think that I, I don't think I ever aspired to be a highly, highly technical, highly impactful um, individual contributor. You know, like I think that role has never quite appealed to me, but the idea of being able to build stuff and bring my ideas to life and create things that other people can use um, has always been really important to me. I think that over time, what I'm building has kind of taken on different, you know, shapes. Um, but at the core, I think the idea of being a builder has always been really close to heart. Mm, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I know that probably most people who are listening to this podcast can absolutely relate to just the, there's something about creating something um, that that process of creation is, is fascinating. Um, so it, through, through all this time, Ed, like, I, I'm trying to come up with a good segue for this, but I'm I'm failing at it. So one of the <laughs> things that, that we uh, talked about as we were getting ready to, to, to talk about this was um, how important it is uh, for people to prepare for you know financial mm-hmm. uh, needs and uh, making long term financial decisions and that kind of thing. So um, like in the context of your own personal experience, why do you think that's so important? Yeah, um, I love that question. I love talking about money. I think money is amazing and very important. Um, Yeah, so for me, money played a big role in my journey. And I don't really think there's, you know, there's a lot of opportunities to talk about that, just the role that money plays in, um, and just our ability to make certain decisions. So when I graduated um, college and got that job as a, um, as a fact checker, I moved to New York City for that position. It did not pay well at all. Uh, I ended up living with my uh, now husband's uh, father in uh, upstate New York and commuted for two hours to the city because I just couldn't afford to live anywhere in the city. Like even mm. I could afford to live in like the 
the bad parts with multiple roommates. Like there was no situation <laughs> that worked for my financial, uh, for my finances. And so uh, that was my life for a good four months until I got uh, the startup job. And with a startup job, I could afford to um, to get my own place. But I was not it was a combination of not getting paid very much because it was you know it's entry level job and then also just being really bad at money and that combination meant that i was living paycheck to paycheck and like didn't think much of it you know like i remember my uh, my husband saying to me like you should really start saving and i was like for what <laughs> you know like i want to go out to eat today and i want to go buy that <laughs> outfit now like why would i need to you know i just didn't i didn't appreciate the value of saving until i got um a job at a startup that was a very very toxic environment and it was a terrible place to work um the boss was very like sexist and everyone ended up kind of like quitting i was the only woman it was just a bad environment to be in and i couldn't afford to quit like I just couldn't afford to. I was stuck. And I remember thinking, oh, this is why you save. <laughs> so you're not in this position where mm. you have to stay at a job that you hate, that makes you feel horrible every single day because you have like nowhere to go, you know? Mm -hmm. And that was really kind of the first like money lesson that I learned. I said to myself, if I'm ever in a position where I can save money, I'm going to save every penny and I'm never, ever going to put myself in this place ever again. Um, and mm -hmm. the good thing about working in tech is for most of us, like we, we are able to save that money and we are able to, you know, have some cushion. And so I think it's really important to, to think long-term about that. Um, and the other big time when money played a big role is, um, after, so, so as a result of me not being able to quit, my, uh, my husband ended up moving up with me. So he became like my roommate. So he moved up to, uh, New Jersey with me and we lived together and that like helped my finances so much. So get a husband. <laughs> it's a, it's been a great financial uh, decision. Yeah. That um, actually has worked out super well for me too. My right? wife is very much a saver, budgeter, that yes. kind of person. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Roommates or partners in general, really good decisions. Um, and so that really helped. And, um, and I was able to get another job relatively quickly, which was great. Um, um, and by the time I decided to quit and do a boot camp, however, I had money saved, but not nearly as much as I needed to. Mm. And I couldn't afford the tuition. And so I got a $4,000 loan from my mom. And my husband agreed to like take care of the bills for the three months that I wasn't working. Um, and that was what allowed me to do that boot camp. And again, it was one of those moments where I was like, man, like if if I didn't have a source of $4,000 and if I wasn't essentially like dating someone who was a, who had a stable full-time job, like where would, I definitely would not be having this conversation with you. I don't know where I'd be, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And so just another opportunity where I said to myself, wow, it's really important for me to save and think long-term and just to appreciate that like money is freedom, money is power. And every time I negotiate, every time I go into, you know, a sponsorship negotiation or, you know, when I was working for someone else, a salary negotiation, I always kept that in the back of my mind, you know? Like whenever I wanted to ask for a little bit more and I was afraid to, I think to myself, I'm not asking for more. I'm asking for more freedom. You know, I'm asking mm. for more of a safety net. Like that's what I'm fighting for. And I'm fighting for like the future me. And that's been a really um, important part of just being financially stable and being able to just make better long-term decisions. Oh, that's, there's so much goodness in there. Um, yeah. So I, I think that, um, I'm trying to to think of the best takeaways or the best ways to phrase the the takeaways that I have from your story. And I think that a lot of it has to do with, I, I appreciate how um, cognizant you are of the privilege that you had um, in that experience. You know, if you hadn't had uh, a boyfriend with a stable income and if you hadn't, and actually on that, I, I think that one of the reasons why having a partner um, where you share finances is you feel... Uh, you no longer can just buy a, a, an outfit and um, now you're just you're accountable to yourself. You're actually right. accountable to someone else and you have to you know answer to them and be like, yeah, OK, so the reason that you couldn't get your <laughs> thing is because I had to get my thing. And um, yeah. so that does help out a lot. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, that you had your your mom who you could, you could take that loan from. And, and so just recognizing that privilege, I think, is really important for people in general to to acknowledge the fact that. Um, yes, you worked really hard and, and we, like we shouldn't um, discredit that. Um, but when we acknowledge our privilege, it, uh, I think that it does something in us to make us more helpful to people who are uh, in a situation unlike our own mm -hmm. where uh, they, they have struggles that maybe we didn't experience ourselves. Absolutely. It sounds like you, 
you were in some pretty tight spots yourself <laughs> from your experiences, but, uh, but everybody has some level of privilege and, and could do something to help um, others who don't have that same privilege. So that's, that's wonderful. Um, yeah, so there's this, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, there's this um, talk that I really like to give. I haven't given it in, in a little while, but it's called Lucky. And it's basically kind of me walking through all the different ways that I'm privileged and how that's really set me up for success. And the takeaway from that talk is I like to say that I was lucky first, so I could work hard later. And that's mm. really, you know, the 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 story of just like my journey is feeling like that four thousand dollar loan, that you know, boyfriend with the job, the ability to have him move in with me, like those were those kicked in at the very beginning of my journey. And those kind of set me up so that later on, I could decide to quit my job and start a company and not feel like it was a huge, you know, a huge risk that I was taking. It set me up to negotiate because I knew that if they said no, I was going to be okay anyway. You know, like it set me up to make those better decisions in the future and for me to like work hard later on. So yeah, I think privilege is super important. I think acknowledging that we're lucky is really important. And I don't think it takes away from my story. You know, I don't think that it takes away from the fact that I have worked, you know, really hard to get to where I am. So yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so let's let's say that somebody is um, struggling with this right now with the the saving money thing. What would you give th to them as advice of something that they could do to like some some people are like, oh yeah, saving money, haha! Ha, I literally spend every cent on rent or whatever on <laughs> right. food. Like, how how do you help somebody um, with? that kind of a situation. Oh, that's a really tough one. Yeah. I mean, for me, I, I, what we've done in the past is we use um, a budgeting tool called YNAB, which is you need a budget, which is this really, really great tool that makes us just more critical on where we actually spend our money because we, you know, look at our, 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 you know, money of the bank, uh, our bank account at the end of the month and go like, where did all that go? Like it's gone. Like what, what happened, <laughs> yeah. you know? Um, and just realizing that we were spending money in ways that we didn't need to. And, you know, it felt, normal in the moment and it felt totally, you know, fine in the moment. But when you are really more critical, you realize that you do have little opportunities to save more money. So I would say start mm -hmm. there and kind of be just really, really honest with yourself and go like, okay, sure, we don't have much at the end, but did we really need to buy that, you know, that steak that one night? Could we have just gotten like the pasta, you know, just like all those little decisions yeah, really to yeah. make a difference. Uh, but I do acknowledge like there's a limit to that, right? At the end of the day, like if if all you have, you know, left over is rent money and you need to spend money on rent and that's it, there's not really much to do. I think that's when we have to ask, you know, bigger questions of are there ways I can improve my work situation? Are there ways where I can live somewhere a little bit more affordable? You know, like that's when life changes might need to occur. And even those are so, so hard. You know, like when mm -hmm. people say, you know, I learned to code and I taught myself, really what that means is I – you know, had a newborn and woke up at 4 a.m. and studied from 4 to 7 a.m. every day for two years and then got a job. You know what I mean? Like those are huge, yeah. huge sacrifices to take. Um, but sometimes like that's that's what we have to do to get to where we want to go. So first up, you know, use an app like that to see if you really, you know, are able to save a little bit, make those little life changes. Um, and if even that's not enough, then it's time to ask some bigger questions and see how can we raise our income level? How can we live a little bit more affordably and see what, um, what needs to be done to make those happen? Uh, I, that, that is such great advice. And, you know, I, I think that just making yourself accountable to yourself. And this is part of what I was, uh, what I meant when we, you know, you have a partner that you're accountable to, but when you write it down, you're like, oh, wow, I didn't, I didn't realize that's how much I spend on coffee every yeah. month, you know, <laughs> or like coffee's the big one. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Like that latte feels like nothing. And then you see, you spent like a hundred dollars on lattes and you're like, oh, well then <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's exactly. a lot. Yeah. You know, and, and I, I don't think that, um, you know, you, you have to totally do away with it, everything that makes you happy in life mm -hmm. or whatever. But, but yeah, like seeing that and being like, you know, I think I'm going to go without that for a month and then I'll have something, you know, that I can actually do something with, um, and, and yeah. get started with, I think is, you know, you just writing it down, um, in something like YNAB or something, it is a really great way to, um, just wake yourself up to the exactly. reality. Yeah. It's, you know, for, for us, it was, so the, the philosophy and there's different philosophies behind different budgeting apps. The philosophy for YNAB is that every dollar should have a job. 
like you should be assigning every dollar a task. And so the way we think about it is like, is this dollar bringing us joy? If we pay rent with this dollar, that is bringing us joy because it makes us happy to have a place to live. (laughs) You know, like (laughs) that is joy. Um, But it, you know, it really helped kind of make sure that we weren't like, we're not unhappy. We're not saving money to the point where we are like miserable. You know, we don't feel Mm -hmm. cheap, but it's also realizing that when I go out and I get like three drinks, I'm not really any happier than I would have been if I had like one drink, but that's still Mm -hmm. made, especially New York prices. Like that makes like a $40 (laughs) difference. You know what I mean? And so it's kind of realizing that there are all these things that we do that we just don't really think much about. You know, we just say like, oh, Mm -hmm. it's just, you know, it's only 40 bucks, it's only 20 bucks. But we realize that if they're not bringing us joy, like all those little expenses that we save can actually lead up to something bigger at the end. Oh, that, yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for that. And if, if, if that was all that we had to talk about, then this show would be awesome. But I actually, <laughs> we want to talk about a couple other things too. Sure. Um, and one of the things that uh, strikes me about your story is that it, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, it, it seems to me like you were never afraid to say that, like, I can do that. Like mm-hmm. um, just going into pre-med school is a daring thing by itself. But then, you know, jumping into a totally different industry uh, with journalism and then I think even a bigger leap uh, from journalism into tech and saying, oh, I can take three months off and learn how to code. Um, I think there are a lot of people who would be like, oh, I'm not sure I, like, <laughs> I'm like i able to do that. Or, yeah, or yeah. I see this a lot where people are like, I've been coding for two years um, and how do I like, um, you know, or, or, or maybe even five years, how do I get out of this junior level feeling that I have? Like they, they just don't, there's no, or there, there's something that's blocking them from feeling like they're able to get to the next level, whatever, whatever they see as the next level for themselves. So can you kind of uh, unpack that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Um, so I think there's a couple things. So the first thing is, um, and I used to actually give another talk called Punch Your Feelings in the Face, um, which I think is a very, very important thing to do in certain situations, not all situations. Feelings are valuable and important. But I think that a lot of times they hold us back. I think a lot of times we, um, I have a career coach who's amazing. She's helped me through so many like difficult career uh, choices and decisions. And she talks about like the saboteur a lot of this idea of, you um, you know, this this character in our mind who is always trying to bring us down and trying to, you know, take us in a different direction that we're just not meant to go. And um, I think we all have our own different like version of that voice. And I think the first thing is kind of recognizing when we do have that voice and recognizing that the best way to silence that voice is to act. You know, it's, you know, when you talk about like being brave, being brave isn't the absence of fear. It's being terrified and doing it anyway. Right. And so we can apply that to anything. If we're afraid of, um, you know, not being able to learn how to code, the best way to the best antidote for that is to learn how to code. You know, mm. like you don't have to be great at it. You don't have to walk out being a rock star, unicorn, 10 Xer, you know, like you can walk <laughs> out just having completed that one tutorial and you will have one, you know. So I think that. Mm being able to meet those feelings with actions and trusting that if you act over and over again, you will have the proof that your feeling is wrong. You know, like you can't Mm. tell me I don't know how to do something when I did it. Like I, I can see it. It's right there. You know what I mean? Like I can, I can Mm -hmm. share it with my friends. Like I've done it. And so I think one of the most powerful things for me is just to, to start, um, to get started, to take it one step at a time, to take it one day at a time, to do that small task that feels more doable than that bigger goal and trust that eventually I'll get to that bigger goal and I'll be Mm. able to silence, um, any voices that I had. When I was learning how to code, um, I was very, very much like I'm too stupid for this. Like this is, this is Mm. not for me. Like I'm, just, I just mm-hmm. can't figure this out. And I said to myself, okay, that's fine. We, we feel these feelings. We acknowledge these feelings. We're going to give ourselves 30 days to just do it anyway. Like no matter how stupid you feel, you're going to wake up, you're going to code for like eight hours. And at the end of that month, then we can reevaluate and make a decision. But until that month is mm-hmm. over, you're just going to deal with these feelings and just do it anyway. So that's my biggest advice is punch your feelings in the face, acknowledge when that needs to happen and just do the actions, do the work and trust that the feelings will have to change because you now have data, you have proof that they are wrong. You know, that uh, I love that so much. And, and one thing like, 
that I really just want to call out specifically about what you said is when, you know, you said, I'm going to give myself 30 days. And at the end of those 30 days, then we'll reevaluate at that time. But I'm just going to punch my feelings in the face right now and, and, and uh, blast through this. And uh, see, like when I was a kid, I wanted to go into the NBA. I don't know, mm. like mo- many kids do want uh-huh. that, uh, like some professional sport or something. And, uh, you know, I, Maybe I could have could have accomplished that, um, but I, I think there are definitely some things that we're just you know maybe physically incapable of doing, or you know we really just we're not cut out for it mm. for one reason or another. Um, and but I think there's a voice in our heads that says we're worse than we really are. Yes. And so the from what it sounds like in in your experience, you fought back on that voice and said, you know what, maybe you're right. It's possible you're right, but I'm gonna I'm gonna see if I can prove you wrong. Mm-hmm. And um, and so I think that is a really valuable golden nugget of advice is to mm-hmm. just say, you know, and, and the way that you, that you put it when we before we started the show, is you said, don't self-select out of things. Yes. Um, so just because you don't think that um, you're worth, you know, a six figure salary, um, you know, you're worth a six figure salary if that's what they offer to you. Exactly. <laughs> you know? It's all about the um, market. It's like whatever the market decides you are worth, that is listen to the market. The market is more right than you are right. So, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. absolutely. Um, that That's just wonderful. Um, so the w- one last thing that I want to pull out of, of your life experience, if if we can call it that way, <laughs> is, um, um, another thing that I, I noticed is it, it seems like you were pretty fearless. You, you were driven by fear and, and frustration, as you said earlier, but um, it, you didn't really seem to hesitate when you decided, you know what, this isn't working. Boom. I'm going to go do something else. Was that really the experience or like, how do you, how would you motivate somebody who's like, Oh, I don't know. I'm kind of on the fence. Like, should I really get going into this? Or like, what do you know, they, they just are analysis paralysis situation. Yeah. So for me, the, the way I've been able to make relatively quick decisions, even when it feels like big life decisions, is I focus on my regret. I focus on like, okay, if I don't do this, what is going to happen? And it's usually that's what motivates me the most. So I'll look at something and I'll go, okay, if I don't, you know, if I don't do this boot camp, what does that mean? That means I'm stuck at this position that I don't like forever. And it's, and I'm not getting paid. Like, I'll make it really dramatic. You know, I'll be like, and I'm going to be stuck here Mm. forever with this life that I'm not happy about not making as much money as I know I can make falling behind all these people that I admire. And like, can we really put up with that? Of course we can't put up with that. Now we must make Mm. a change. So that's been like Mm. really useful for me is just figuring out if I don't take this action, what is the worst case scenario and focusing on that worst case scenario and deciding that like, it's not worth it to me to risk that worst case scenario. And my best option is to make that decision that seems a little bit scary. So really like picturing and visualizing that worst case has been really useful to me. Oh, that that sounds so great. And if you don't mind, there's a, a something very similar that Ryan Florence um, told me uh, when I was trying to make a big career decision. And he said, well, you need to think about three scenarios and think about what you would experience or, or how you would feel about your life when you're like in your 80s thinking back on life in these three different scenarios. So either you don't do it and uh, at all, or you do it and it doesn't work out, or you don't do it and it does work out. Mm. And based on how that all plays out in your mind um, can really help inform your decision. Uh, you know, that. and then you have to weigh the risk of like how likely is it to not work out and all that. But that really helps me, in my experience, that's helped me to frame things in a good Love way. Love that. Yeah, that's great. That's a beautiful way to put yeah. it. Wonderful. Well, Saran, this has been such a wonderful chat with you. Thank you so much for giving me your time today and, and, and the audience. Um, if they were here, I'm sure they'd be clapping and saying thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, you know, if you're listening right now, you can go ahead and clap and say thank you. And all the people look <laughs> around at you. Kind of weird. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so um, we want to give the audience two pieces of homework based on our, our conversation today. And I'll, I'll just go ahead and tell, tell everybody those things. The first one. It's and I love this idea. This is Saran's um, piece of homework for you. Start a gratitude journal. So do you want to just describe to the audience what a gratitude journal is? Sure. Yeah. So we got this idea from this um, video series on YouTube called In a Nutshell. 
highly, highly recommend it. These beautiful animations that talk about all kinds of like scientific um, topics. They do a lot of like space and um, biology, that sort of thing. And they had one on dissatisfaction and on the antidote for dissatisfaction. How do you live a happier, more fulfilling life? And all of the data and the research shows that the antidote for dissatisfaction is gratitude. And it's literally just taking a moment to look at your life, your surroundings, and just be grateful for the things that you have. And so one of the things that like scientists recommend that you do is to keep a gratitude journal. So every night we keep it um, at the side of our bed on our nightstand. We have this journal and every night we write down five things that we're really grateful for. And sometimes they're huge things like I'm grateful that, you know, the, the world is still spinning and people are still existing other times it's super small (laughs) like i'm really glad i had those strawberries for you know for my snack today those strawberries were extra sweet it could be really small (laughs) like that um and uh we write them every day we've been doing that for the last couple months and it's really changed just our outlook on everything it's really changed those days especially it's come really in handy especially on those days where like you have a bad day and it's a bad mental health day and you're just kind of discouraged and when you take a moment you take literally a couple minutes just look around and go you know what things aren't quite as bad, you know, and things are, you know, there, there's some, there's still some joy even in the darkness. Um, so those have been really helpful and I highly recommend doing a gratitude journal. Oh, that's wonderful. And it takes, I should say, it takes like at least a month for it to really kick in. So give it like at least a month to see if you feel any different about things. And then, um, let me know how it goes. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So I have done a gratitude journal, but only for two weeks. So I ah. am going to, I'm going to give this a try. There you go. Um, <laughs> so our second piece of homework for everybody is, um, and actually this one's a really good one. This is a, the, the jobs one. Do you want to describe it? Uh, sure. Sarah? Yeah. So people ask me all the time, you know, I'm interested in getting into tech and to learning how to code, but I'm not sure where to start. You know, there's so many different languages and frameworks and tools and technologies I could learn. Where do I begin? And my one piece of advice for them is I say, go look up your dream job. What is the dream job you have, the dream company you want to work for? Write down five options for yourself. If you could have any job right now at the best company you could think of, what are those jobs? Find those job postings, put them in a spreadsheet, figure out what the keywords and what the uh, required skills are for each job. See what each job has in common. And then that's your list. That's your curriculum. That's the stuff that you need to learn. So out of that list, pick one technology, one tool, one language that you recognize that has been repeated, you know, across these job postings and start learning that one thing. That's perfect. Perfect. Something I can put on a list and check it off. So I hope that people listening do that. Um, if you're not experiencing your dream job right now, then absolutely experience it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and this is a great place to start. Um, so what's the best way for people to connect with you, Saran, if they would like to tell you about how their dream journal or their uh, gratitude journal is going? Yeah, Twitter is the best place. So you can tweet me at Saran Yitbarek, so just my first name, last name. Um, my DMs are open, although I'm very bad at checking them, so it might take me like a while to get back to you. Uh, but you can still DM me, and I'll, I will eventually respond, I promise. <laughs> very good. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. This has been such a pleasure to chat with you, um, and I hope that the audience has really enjoyed this as well and and we can all be a little bit more grateful and um just go for whatever we're trying to do and budget um and budget there you go (laughs) all right thanks everyone we'll see y'all later thank you